Hey, what is going on guys? My name is Floris and welcome back to another Crypt of the Necrodancer boss guide video. In this episode, we are going to take a look at our second boss on the list, which is going to be King Konga. King Konga is another non-story related boss in Crypt of the Necrodancer. Upon entering this boss fight, players will encounter numerous enemies within a relatively large room. Despite this room being quite large, there's often a lot of scenarios where the fight gets really intense considering there are so many of these enemies around. Therefore this fight shouldn't be underestimated in the slightest. Basically how this fight works is that it consists of two phases. The first phase requires players to eliminate both of the conga lines. Now the conga lines are the lines of zombies that always spawn in the middle of the room. As for King Konga himself, he always sits in his throne behind the conga lines. During the first phase, he will not leave his throne unless the player loses multiplier, which is by missing a beat for example. When this happens, the boss will step out of his throne and starts to approach the player. When the player manages to hit the boss, he will teleport back to his throne, but he will not take damage in the process. In order to damage this boss, players will have to take out the conga lines first. Well, Technically it's still possible to damage the boss without the conga lines being defeated. This is by using some advanced techniques which will be covered later on this guide as well. But as for normal circumstances it is required that players defeat the conga lines first before they are able to damage the boss. Once the conga lines have been defeated, King Konga will step out of his throne and will now approach the player. This is basically the same thing as when players would have missed the beat during the fight. Although this time around, King Konga will not teleport back to his throne instead to any other location in the room and more importantly he will also take damage in the process. From here on it's simply a matter of damaging him until the fight is over. Once again for every non-story related boss there's multiple boss variants depending on what zone the player encounters this boss fight. As for the first zone the enemies that are given are 2 bats, 1 rat bat and 2 ghosts. For the second zone we have 1 bat, 1 rat bat, 2 armadillos, 1 yellow armadillo, 1 skeleton mage and 1 black skeleton mage. As for the third zone, this is going to be even more crowded. It's going to be one bat, one rat bat, one goblin, one grey goblin, one fire elemental, one ice elemental, one hellhound and one yeti. As for the last zone, we've got one bat, one black bat, one apprentice blade master, one blade master, one warlock, one neon warlock and two goblin bombers. Alright, so now that we understand how the fight works and what kind of enemies we can expect, it is time to dive into the strategies. Starting off with the general strategies, which are strategies that often make use of certain items such as spells or bombs. In this category, we are going to take a look at a total of 3 different strategies. First off, we're starting with the quick kill strategy and later on we'll take a look at the dig strategy as well as the earthquake strategy. The first strategy that we're going to take a look at is the quick kill strategy. Now the quick kill strategy can be executed with a single bomb and works on every King Konga variant. As for King Konga 1, King Konga 2 and King Konga 3, this will instantly kill the boss. As for King Konga 4, this will leave the boss with only one hurt remaining. The reason for this is because the last King Konga variant is stronger, meaning he has more health. So the bomb will not instantly kill him, but will still take a huge amount of health away. You can still use this strategy on the final King Konga variant if you want, but bear in mind, you will need to hit him another time before he's finished. As for the strategy itself, it's a pretty simple strategy and it shouldn't take you too much time before you get the hang of it. Basically when you enter the fight, you want to make your way towards the boss so there's no need to kill all of the enemies in the room first. And once you stand in front of the boss, you want to take the following steps. The first thing you want to do is to stand exactly on the right side of the throne. The next thing you want to do is to place a bomb. From here on, you want to walk one step to the right. At this point you want to hit the upper wall or miss a beat on purpose. It doesn't really matter as long as you lose the multiplier and that will make King Konga leave his throne. At this point you want to walk another step to the right and this will instantly kill King Konga and you will thereby win the fight. One important thing to mention when it comes down to the quick kill strategy is that this strategy only works on the right side of the throne. When you execute this strategy on the left side of the throne it doesn't work and now there's actually quite a lengthy explanation of why it doesn't work has to do with the game mechanics but I'm not going to dive into that too much so if you want to use this strategy always make sure that you're standing on the right side of the throne. Alright moving on to see what characters can use this strategy. 
Out of all characters in the game, there is going to be a total of 3 characters where the strategy does not work. The first one is Aria because in order to execute the strategy, we have to lose the multiplier and as we know, Aria dies from losing the multiplier, so that is not going to work. However, you could sacrifice a potion in order for the strategy to work, so technically yes, it's still possible with Aria. But then again, you have to sacrifice a potion and the question is, is that really worth it? From personal experience, I wouldn't say so because in the case you get hit, you always have like a second chance with the potion and without the potion you will die instantly. As for Koda, it doesn't work either and now that's exactly the same thing. You will lose your multiplier and thereby die in case you have a potion, but definitely don't recommend doing so. Finally, this strategy doesn't work for Manly either and the reason of this is because when you move to the right side, what will actually happen is that you will damage King Konga in the process, so he will get back to his throne and afterwards the bomb will explode, so the bomb will not instantly kill him. Moving on to the second strategy, the second strategy is the dig strategy. Now as the name suggests, this strategy is about digging. So did you know that you can actually dig through King Konga's throne? By doing so, you will destroy the throne and skip right towards the final phase. The dig strategy works on every King Konga variant, but there's one important thing we have to keep in mind. As we all know, digging is done with a shovel, but in order to dig through the throne, we need a powerful shovel. Not every shovel is capable of digging through the throne, in fact, in order to dig through the throne, we need a shovel of tier 3 or above. This can be one of the following shovels. First of all, you can use a pickaxe, although keep in mind with a pickaxe that you have to dig through the throne a total of 3 times before it gets destroyed. Next to that, you can use a obsidian shovel, but when using the shovel, the multiplier has to be at its maximum. Moreover, you can use the glass shovel and finally you can use the blood shovel as well, although keep in mind that you will need to sacrifice 0.5 HP. That is basically all there is for the dig strategy. It's a very simple concept, very straightforward, so let's see what characters can use this strategy. Out of all characters in the game, the dig strategy is suitable for each and every character. The last strategy that we're going to take a look at is the earthquake strategy. Now, this strategy requires the use of an earthquake skull. And basically what it does is that it makes you eliminate both of the conga lines instantly and thereby go straight towards the final phase. Once you enter the boss fight, all you have to do is to approach the conga lines and from there on pop your earthquake scroll. It is literally that simple. One important thing to mention though is that the earthquake scroll deals damage to every enemy within a 10 tile radius. This means you cannot simply pop your scroll from the moment you enter the boss fight as there's a high chance that a part of the conga line is outside of this 10 tile radius. Therefore you want to make sure that you're standing quite close to the conga lines before popping your earthquake scroll. After popping the earthquake scroll, all of the zombies as well as most of the enemies will instantly die and from here on you can simply finish off the boss. The earthquake scroll is very useful for this fight as it basically gives you a free win. If you ever come across an earthquake scroll, it is highly recommended to solely save that scroll for the king conga boss fight. Now, before we move on to see what characters can use this strategy, you might wonder what happened to the other spells or scrolls. As for the remaining spells and scrolls, such as the fireball or the freeze, they aren't much recommended for this fight. You could still use them though, and they sure are helpful for making this fight easier, but in most scenarios, you might be better off saving them. This is because the fireball and freeze items are incredibly useful for other boss fights. The only time it's recommended to use the fireball or the freeze items is when you're using the spell variants because spells regenerate over time so it doesn't really matter if you use them. Or when King Konga turns out to be your final boss. Other than that, you're better worth saving them for other bosses. Moving on to see what characters can use the earthquake strategy. Out of all characters in the game, everyone can use this strategy so the next time you come across an earthquake scroll, regardless of what character you're playing as, make sure to save it for the King Konga boss fight. The next category that we're going to take a look at is the low percent strategies. Once again, we're going to take a look at each boss variant, which means King Konga 1, King Konga 2, King Konga 3 and King Konga 4. And we're going to see how we can approach these fights without using any items. The first boss that we're going to take a look at is King Konga 1. Now King Konga 1 is the easiest variant of them all. Overall, there aren't really that many enemies around and most of the enemies are quite harmless. So yeah, shouldn't be too difficult. The approach for this fight is fairly simple, you want to enter the room by going through the middle doorway and from here on you want to proceed in a straight line towards the middle of the room. 
At this point, you want to jump back and forth and let the conga lines come towards you. Now, this sounds very straightforward, but there's actually one important thing to take note of here. Basically, there's two ways of jumping back and forward. Now, one is the right way and one is the wrong way. So, one will guarantee the absolute most safety and the other one will probably screw you over. So, let's take a look at both of them. As for the safe way, you want to make sure that you move towards the conga lines at the same time as they approach you. So here's an example of this. I'm going to move towards the conga lines and simultaneously they will approach me. So now I'm backing up and move towards them and they will approach me. By doing so, you will always end up safely between the conga lines. As for doing it the wrong way, this is done by doing the exact opposite, which is moving away from the conga lines at the same time as they approach you. So here's another example, I'm going to move away from the conga lines at the same time as they approach me. So I take a step back and they approach me and I move forward and I'm going to move back and they approach me. So if I keep doing this, eventually I will end up between the conga lines. Now you might wonder why this is the wrong way of doing this, as in the end we're still standing safely between the conga lines. That is why, although this time we have a back face towards the area. Now as a result of this, the ghost, and you might already see them coming, are going to approach you as well. The ghosts are certainly going to interfere with this fight, so it definitely makes it a lot more annoying to take out the zombies. Therefore you want to make sure that you don't move away from the conga lines at the same time as they approach you, but instead you want to move towards them. This way you will always end up safely between the conga lines, and the ghost will not be able to interfere. Once you're standing between the conga lines, it is a simple matter of finishing them off. Now, this is very simple to do. All you have to do is to hit one zombie first, then the opposite, then the opposite, etc. So, keep on repeating this until the conga lines have been defeated. And from here on, you can take on the boss. As for finishing off the boss, very simple. All you have to do is to jump around, wait till the boss gets close, and from there on, you can hit him. And yeah, just keep on repeating those steps, and eventually, you will win the fight. Next up we've got King Konga 2 and the second King Konga boss fight isn't too difficult but it can still cause some issues if you don't take the right precautions. As for this boss fight we cannot simply just walk to the Konga lines and eliminate them. This time there's a bit more enemies around and we're required to get rid of some enemies before we can approach the Konga lines. The first enemy that we want to take out is the yellow armadillo and the reason of this is because similar to the first boss fight we want to jump back and forward in the middle of the room. However, this is easier said than done as the yellow armadillo also spawns in the middle of the room and oftentimes when entering this fight the yellow armadillo will spot you straight away and charge at you. That is why you want to take him out first. Fortunately enough in most scenarios we can already spot where the yellow armadillo is located. Now if you're playing on PC you have a slight advantage because on PC there's an option to zoom out the screen and by zooming out the screen you will always know where the yellow armadillo is located. As for us console players, we cannot, so this means that most of the time we can spot where the yellow armadillo is located, but not all the time, and it all comes down to the layout of the boss room. So basically when you're looking into the room, there's a total of three things that can happen. The first thing is that you can spot the yellow armadillo straight away. The second thing that can happen is that you're unable to spot the yellow armadillo, however one of the utmost black tiles is lighter than the other ones, and this indicates that the yellow armadillo is located in that specific row. So he is positioned just a little bit above the bright tile. And finally it can happen that the armadillo is nowhere to be seen. So every utmost tile is black as well as there's no indication either. Those three scenarios are what you will often encounter. Now what we want to do is to enter the fight in the same line as the yellow armadillo. By doing so the yellow armadillo will immediately charge at you. So for situation one this is pretty self explanatory because you're able to spot them straight away. All you have to do is to enter the fight in the same line as the yellow armadillo. As for celebration 2, always be on the lookout for that one tile that's brighter than the rest because that is the row where the yellow armadillo is located. This means that you have to enter the fight in the same line as the bright tile. As for celebration number 3, there's simply no way to tell where the yellow armadillo is located. At this scenario, it's highly recommended to enter the fight in the middle row and move up one or two tiles. From here on, you should be able to spot the yellow armadillo. If you're lucky enough, the yellow armadillo is located in the middle row and is already charging at you. If not, simply move one step to the right or one to the left and it should charge at you as well. After the yellow armadillo is charging at you, make your way to the very bottom of the room. You want to take out the yellow armadillo all the way to the bottom. And this is because there's no enemies at the bottom and at the time, 
the other enemies are still trying to catch up to you so it gives you some time to eliminate the yellow arm diddle without having to worry about any nearby enemies. When you're standing on the bottom of the screen make sure to keep jumping back and forth and let the yellow armor dealer crash into the wall and once he's vulnerable start to attack him. You will always have enough time to eliminate him when you keep jumping back and forth next to the place where he's about to crash into. Once the yellow armor dealer has been dealt with start to jump back and forth to get in between the conga lines. This time however it shouldn't matter too much if you jump away from the conga lines at the same time as they avoid you as this time around there are no ghosts in the room. If done correctly, you should now stand perfectly in the middle of the conga lines, however we're not there yet, it can still go downhill pretty quickly if you don't pay close attention. The next thing we want to do is to keep on hitting the conga lines, but while we're doing so we should focus less on the conga lines themselves and more on the skeleton mages walking around. There's a few scenarios that can happen with the skeleton mages, once again it all comes down to their starting position and the position of the enemies in the room. Those factors will determine how the skeleton mages will act alongside the conga lines. Most of the time when you're standing between the conga lines, the skeleton mages will approach you from the side. And that is a good thing, because when they are trying to attack you from the side, they will automatically get blocked by the conga lines. The game prioritizes the conga lines over the skeleton mages, and as a result of this, they are less in line and barely can cause any trouble. Sometimes you might be even really lucky where a skeleton mage is approaching you from the side, but does this from quite a long distance. If that is the case, then they're bound to step on one of the confused traps, and this is even better because this way they won't even get near you. Now, unfortunately enough, there's also moments where it gets a bit more tricky. You see, sometimes the skeleton mages will not approach you from the side, but instead from the middle. In most cases, this is because an armadillo is blocking their path, so they take an alternate route by going through the middle. This is a bad thing because when they are coming from the middle of the room there's nothing blocking their path and eventually they will catch up to you and you will get hit. At the moment you start to notice that one of the skeleton mages is coming from the top side or the middle of the room, you need to prepare yourself for an escape situation. Basically what you're trying to do is to get rid of as many zombies as possible and once the skeleton mage is almost near you it is time to make your escape. At this point you want to back up all the way so as far as you possibly can to the back of the room and from here on make a clockwise or anti-clockwise rotation. Once you've made a rotation and given you've eliminated the conga lines, the last phase will start. From here on simply attack the boss when he's close. As for the other enemies, you can either avoid them or eliminate them, it doesn't really matter. The good news is that you have plenty of space available so even if you decide to fight off the remaining enemies, they shouldn't cause too much issues. From here on simply keep on hitting the boss until the fight is over. Moving on to King Konga 3 and the third King Konga variant is by far the hardest variant out of them all. Not only will you face a lot of enemies, but also the enemies that you're facing are rather annoying to deal with. The approach for the King Konga 3 boss fight highly depends on the position of the enemies, in particular the Konga lines. As you might already have noticed from the previous boss fights, the Konga lines can either have a big or small opening. And the approach for this King Konga 3 boss fight will heavily depend on the opening of the Konga lines. When there's a small opening, we will have to create a different route opposed to a big opening. So in other words, you can approach this fight in two ways and it all depends on the opening of the conga lines. First we're going to take a look at the small opening strategy. Now once you walk towards the middle of the room and you notice that the conga lines have a small opening, so only three tiles between them, make sure to execute the following steps. Firstly, take out one of the elementals, not both but only one. The reason of this is because if you take out both elementals, oftentimes both the conga lines and one of the goblins will catch up to you and altogether it gets really hectic. You can still get away with it though, but it's pretty risky and it's not recommended. In the end, you really want to create a bit more breathing space for yourself to make it more easier. Therefore, we don't want to stay too long on the same spot and only take out one of the elementals and preferably the one that is closest by. Once you take out one of the elementals, it is time for a detour. Our next target is the Hellhound, located on the top left. Make your way to the left and from there on go up. You will cross paths with the Hellhound and should have no problems eliminating him on the spot. From here on, make your way to the top of the room. At this point, you should have more space available and can focus on the remaining enemies. For instance, the Yeti on the top right of the screen and the other elemental that you left alone. It is recommended that you take out most of the enemies before engaging with the conga lines. Once you eliminated most of the enemies in the room, it is simply a matter of taking out the conga lines and from there on eliminate the boss. 
As for the big opening strategy, once you walk towards the middle of the room and notice that the conga lines have a big opening, so 5 tiles, make sure to execute the following steps. The first thing we want to do is to take out both elementals and this time we can actually take them out both because there's more distance between us and the conga lines. This buys us more time to eliminate both of the elementals while still maintaining a safe distance between ourselves and the other enemies. Once both of the elementals have been taken out, it is time to make your way towards the top side of the room. Once on the other side, we want to go towards the top left and from here on we can eliminate the Hellhound. After eliminating the Hellhound, it is time to walk around the room and from here on eliminate the remaining enemies. Once you eliminate most of the enemies, well preferably all of the enemies, it is simply a matter of taking out the conga lights and from there on you can finish off the boss. Both strategies mentioned, so the small opening strategy as well as the big opening strategy will help you get through this fight more easily. The strategies themselves are pretty solid and will work most if not all of the time. Last up we've got King Konga 4. The final King Konga variant is probably the second hardest variant out of them all. During this fight you will encounter quite a lot of enemies, although fortunately enough most of these enemies aren't too difficult to deal with. There's actually several ways to approach this boss fight and once again it all comes down to the placement of certain enemies. This time however it's not the conga lines that determine the approach for this fight, but it's the goblin bombers. The first thing you want to do is the open the middle doorway, make sure you don't enter the room just yet, we want to take a close look at the goblin bombers first. The goblin bombers are located both on the left and the right side of the room and when you look at the goblin bombers there's a total of 3 things that can happen. The first thing that can happen is that both of the goblin bombers are standing on a confused trap and as a result of this they are being confused. The second thing that can happen is that one goblin bomber stands on a confusion trap and is confused and the other one is unaffected. Finally it can happen that both of the goblin bombers are unaffected by the confusion trap. There is three scenarios that can happen and every scenario has a slightly different approach to this fight so we're going to take a look at each scenario and we're going to see how we can approach these situations the best way possible. First up we've got the double confusion effect, once you notice that both of the goblin bombers are confused make sure to execute the following steps. First thing you want to do is to step into the room and make your way towards the middle. The reason why you want to move to the middle when the goblin bombers are confused is pretty straightforward. When the goblin bombers are confused they will automatically move away from the player and this is something that we can use to our advantage. This way we can create more space for ourselves in the middle. From here on you want to take out both the Warlock and the Apprentice Blade Master. At this time you shouldn't have to worry too much about the Goblin Bombers as they have been walking away from you for most of the time when being confused. Once the two enemies in the middle of the room have been dealt with, it is time to focus on the remaining enemies. Now the best thing you can do is to move all across the room, this way you have more space available and moreover you will create a longer distance between yourself and the conga lines. From here on you want to take out the remaining enemies, preferably one by one as this makes it fairly doable. Once you eliminate most of the enemies in the room, it is simply a matter of taking out the conga lines and finishing off the boss. Moving on to the single confusion effect, once you notice that one goblin bomber is confused and the other one is unaffected, make sure to execute the following steps. First thing you want to do is to kill the goblin bomber that is not confused. After the goblin bomber has been killed, it is time to deal with the warlock and the apprentice blade master in the middle of the room. Once both enemies have been eliminated, it's the same story as the previous time, make your way towards the opposite side of the room. Once you reach the opposite side of the room, focus on the remaining enemies and try to take them out, preferably one by one. Finally, after eliminating most, if not all of the enemies in the room, it is simply a matter of taking out the conga lines and finishing off the boss. Last up, we've got the zero confusion effect and the last scenario is probably the hardest one out of them all, as there's a high chance it can really hectic near the bottom of the room. Once you notice that neither Goblin Bombers are confused, make sure to execute the following steps. First thing you want to do is to kill the Goblin Bomber that's standing closest by. After eliminating the first Goblin Bomber, you want to make your way to the other Goblin Bomber and from here on eliminate him. From here on, you can either do two things. Either you kill the Warlock and the Apprentice Blade Master in the middle of the room, or you make a big rotation around the room. It highly depends on the opening of the conga line, so when you get a small opening, you often tend to go for the big rotation. Whereas with a big opening, you often have more time in the middle, which means you can still kill off the Warlock and the Apprentice Blade Master. After making a big rotation around the room, or eliminating the enemies in the middle, from here on it is time to focus on the remaining enemies. Same story applies here, try to take out the remaining enemies one by one, as this makes it fairly doable. Finally, after eliminating most of the enemies in the room, it is simple a matter of taking out the combo lines and finishing off the boss. 
That is basically all there is to King Kong of 4. Long story short, it all comes down to the position of the Goblin Bombers. You want to analyze where they are located and whether they are confused or not. Once that's clear, you can adjust your approach to the fight accordingly. Finally, and this is something very important to mention, it should be noted that whenever you're standing in a door opening and you are jumping back and forward, for instance because you want to stay on the beat, know that eventually the confuse effect of the Goblin Bombers will wear off. This is something that we absolutely don't want to have as this certainly messes up our strategies. Therefore, once you open a door and you notice that either one or both of the Goblin Bombers are confused, you want to get into the fight immediately. When you take too long, the confusion effect will wear off, so be cautious about that. Okay, so at this point we should have a full understanding on how this boss fight works and what kind of strategies we can use for nearly every situation. That is right, nearly every situation because there's one aspect we haven't quite covered yet and that is the character specific strategies. Once again, we will take a look at each character in the game and see how we can approach these boss fights the best way possible. As for Bart, Bolt, Cadence and Melody, the approach for the fights are going to stay the same as what's been explained in the previous chapters. As for Arya, the approach also stays the same as what has been explained in the previous chapter but there's one important tip to point out. Occasionally, it might happen that you find yourself in a pretty awkward situation with one of these zombies. For instance, when the first zombie in the conga line steps on a confusion trap, when this happens, the zombie usually starts to render off by himself. Eventually, the zombie will catch up to you and from here on there's two things that can happen. Either the zombie stands right beside you and if that is the case then there's no issues, you can just simply finish him off. Or the zombie catches up to you and he stands one tower away from you. So when he's standing one tower away from you, this is pretty awkward because at this point we cannot simply attack him. So we have to find another solution for this. In order to get rid of the zombie without having to skip any beats, you could throw your weapon instead. Basically what you want to do is to lure the zombie towards one of the walls. Try to bring the zombie as close as possible to the wall and from here on you can throw your weapon. Definitely do not throw your weapon all across the room, you might get rid of the zombie but there's also potential that suddenly another enemy is in your way and without any weapons that is going to be a rough time. As for Dorian, Dorian has quite an advantage over the other characters when it comes down to the King Konga boss fight. Not only does Dorian have a higher damage output and can take on more hits, but he also starts off with a pickaxe. As we've learned in the general strategies, the pickaxe can be used to dig through the King Kong as thrown. So when playing as Dorian, it's highly recommended to use this strategy as often as possible. This makes the boss fight a lot easier as you can simply skip onto the last phase and finish off the boss quickly. Moving on to Eli, out of all bosses in the game, King Konga is probably the worst one when playing as Eli. There's a lot of enemies in the room and certain enemies have potential to cause great danger. In particular the enemies that move one tile every beat, so an example King Konga himself, the ghost, the goblins, the confused zombies etc. Therefore always be on the lookout for these type of enemies as they can end your run very easily. They should be taken out with utmost precaution. Strategy wise, it is actually recommended to use the quick kill strategy that we've seen in the general strategies as often as possible. When you're playing as Eloy, you have unlimited bombs and you might as well use that to your advantage. Finally, the approach for Koda as well as for Monk stays the same as what has been explained in the previous chapters, but there are some minor things to look out for when playing as these characters. When playing as either Monk or Koda, you're constantly trying to avoid gold. Now, generally speaking, avoiding gold during a King Konga boss fight isn't too much of an issue. The room itself is pretty large and oftentimes you can spot the gold for miles ahead. That being said, there's one particular boss variant where it gets really easy to step into gold. This is the King Konga 2 boss fight. The second King Konga variant might not be the hardest one, but it is for sure one of the most dangerous variants when playing as either Koda or Monk. This is because of the skeleton mages. The skeleton mages have the ability to suck you inwards and this can actually put you on top of a pile of gold and instantly kill you. So be extremely cautious around these enemies as these tactics are very cheap and can end your run without you even realizing it. As for Koda, the same thing applies as for Arya, so if there's an awkward gap between you and the zombie, you want to throw your weapon, but this time around, you want to make sure that there's a bit more space between the zombie and the wall. This is because if you throw your weapon when the zombie is against the wall, your dagger will end up laying on a pile of gold, and it's definitely something we don't want to have here. Therefore, you want to make sure that there's always some space between the zombie and the wall when throwing your weapon. And finally, and this is a tip solely meant for Monk, is that Monk starts off with a blood shovel and as we know from the general strategies, 
The Blood Shovel is also a shovel that can be used to dig through the King Konga's throne. In the rare occasion that you might not have any bombs available, you can always use the Blood Shovel to skip to the final phase immediately. Be wary though that you will have to sacrifice 0.5 HP for the deck, but at least you can end the boss fight quickly. And so here we are, we made it through the King Konga boss guide, hey! So once again, it was quite a lengthy guide, but it's still very in-depth regardless. So hopefully this guide will come to good use. If there's still a strategy that you're aware of, but has not been covered in this guide, feel free to leave a comment down below, as not only am I curious to see what this strategy is about, but also it might help out other players who are trying to get better at this particular boss fight. I would like to thank you all for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next episode where we will take on the Coral Rift boss fight. Another episode you don't want to miss out on so stay tuned for more and until next time, bye!